Hey guys, and welcome back to my Making Ultimate Tic-Tac-Toe in Minecraft series. Last episode, I built some of the combinational logic for my output display. In this video, I plan on exploring some community implementations of the display to gain ideas for my own. If you remember from my last episode, I decided that the display was going to be too bulky to realistically create. Well, in retrospect, I realize it might not be that bad. It'll be very large for sure, but it's not impossibly large. It is far larger than both the community displays that I'm going to feature in this episode, though. This is because my display uses a different technique than the other displays that I'd like to highlight. The way my display works is that an input or combination of inputs will light up a picture on the screen. An active input directly drives the logic which directly drives the display. The way both of the community displays work is that an input comes into the display and is clocked in, which just means effectively an activation signal is sent in, telling the display to latch or remember the input. Consider this simple demo where I'm going to be driving a display of my type and a display of this latching type. Let's see how I would turn the bottom left piece and the bottom left local board on. In my design, you would simply turn on either the X or O line for the bottom left piece. In this new latching type, you would need to do something a bit more complex. The latching design uses only a handful of data lines and one clock line to control the display. This might seem crazy given how many pixels are on the board, but let's look at how to address the bottom leftmost piece. Four lines are for the local board selection. Each display is given an identification number, which is converted into binary and used as an input. Four lines are for piece selection. Similarly, each piece in a local board is given an identification number, which is used as an input. Then there is one more input. An X or O bit is used to draw either an X or an O. We never specified whether to use small pieces or big pieces, but we can code this data in the piece selection since there are seven unused states. We can also add a reset code to erase an entire local board. So going back to our comparison, we can write to the bottom leftmost piece by using the binary ID for the local board, the binary ID for the piece, and selecting either an X or an O. Once all the data is ready, we can clock it in by pulling the clock line high then low which tells the display to remember the data. This method to address the latching display is specific to one implementation done by community member Slick, but the general idea holds for both. Specifically, the display stores the data we inputted on the rising edge of the clock, or when the clock transitions from off to on. This isn't super important, but it does mean that once the clock goes high, the data at the input is free to change because the display has remembered it. This is not true of my original design though, as if the input signals are removed, the display defaults back to its original state, which shows nothing. This isn't a bad thing per se, because if the display is directly hooked to the data storage array, the current game state will just be constantly outputted. All right, I'm going to be switching over to my live talks with two community members, Dan Snell and Slick. I'm going to start with Dan Snell's design for no other reason than I did the tour with him first. This is my display. Each local board consists of one of these square things. I guess a pixel would be considered just one lamp. Yeah, this is just an isolated version of the square. So here's the X. It's not like a diagonal X, but it's the best I can do. Yeah, it, I guess it's one of those things without any specialized circuitry. It's a clear difference between the O, so it's really the best yeah. you can do there. Why was he not able to create a perfect X, though? Well, this comes down to the simplified design he's using to connect the pixels. By powering the center block, it powers the adjacent four blocks as well. This means a simple plus image can be created using only one input line. And then the O. Yeah, it's nice, it's so compact, it all fits in right behind the pixel, nothing sticks up. So that's the pixels, and then obviously there's nine local boards that make up the global board. There's all the wiring behind the scenes. Yeah, so you select a local board by choosing, like, it doesn't have a name, but I call it my coordinate system. There's, like, iron, gold, diamond, and iron, gold, and diamond. And so if you were to press, say, this button, then every, then the three local boards across the top are now able to get inputs. And then along here, say I press this one. Oh wait, Ooh, that's not, it shouldn't be down like that. Okay, I guess I have some bugs to fix with it. But the reset does work. I'm gonna have to fix the selection thing, but that's the general gist of it. So like iron and iron means that this one this local board would be selected. Okay. So then in the back, like where are the inputs exactly? Like if I wanted to address, let's say the bottom left pixel on the bottom left local board, like how would you go through to do that? It's uh, this one right here. So assuming that all of the things were in line for it to activate, the second part of the coordinate system is supposed to be either choose the quartz or the sandstone, and that determines whether the input that 
goes into here will be either the X or the O. So that's interesting then. So you just have an input that says X or O and then the logic figures out which one it should be. So like if I pressed this button, only this piston, this piston, and this piston are supposed to activate. But they all activate. So I'll need to fix that somehow. When you select a local board, are you selecting just the board, or are you selecting local board and XRO at the same time, or are those like two separate systems? It's, it's going, it's going to be two separate systems, but basically the same thing. If you think of it like this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, the x-axis will be selected, and then you'll either select y1 or y2. Because this is such a critical system in Dan Snell's board, I wanted to break it down fully. The idea is that the back of the board has a piece select input, which comes from the player choosing where to play. It's up to the control logic to choose the correct local board and piece type. These two systems connect together, but are for the most part separate. If I wanted to address the middle local board and play an X, I would activate the center row in the coordinate system, but I would activate the X central column on top. So do you want to do a quick, well, it, the local boards weren't quite working, right? But is yeah. anything selected right now? Like, is it possible to quickly write to one of the pixels? I think I can manually do it. So if we're going to say, this top right square is going to be an O. I need to activate this, and then just so that only that one fires, and then that fires, and ta-da! There's also a reset button right here. Now I'll switch over to my talk with Slick. Here we see a piece controlled by an encoder on the light blue circuits. The state of each pixel is determined by a redstone wire or a redstone repeater next to the redstone torch. A wire means the pixel is on when this bit is activated, and a repeater means it's off. The light green circuit is just routing between the pink inputs and the encoder. Each input controls which bit of the encoder is on. The outer two control the small pieces, and the inner two control the large pieces which comprise the local board's large piece. For example, this input is the large X. So, in order for this to light up, you need every single pixel except for the top left and bottom right. So, for this line of torches, the top right and bottom left have repeaters next to them while all the others have redstone wire. This eliminates the need for a bunch of logic circuits, as this is hardwired, and while it does require more effort, it does make it simpler in the long run. Now, nine of these pieces are placed together to make a local board. As you can see, the inner inputs are all tied together with the slime block stacks being the links between each layer of these horizontal lines. You can see here that I've actually left the inputs for the individual pieces blank as it's just too cluttered to show here. Here we can see all of the SR latches. There are 20 in total. There are two for each of the local X's and O's for each piece, plus these two odd ones out here which control the large X and large O for each local board. What is an SR latch? Well, the idea is that two inputs, called set and reset, control a single bit of memory. If the set line is turned on, the latch stores that information, even after the signal is removed. Similarly, if the reset line is turned on, then that latch turns off, even if the signal is removed. The red lines here are resets. Once one of these is activated, all the SR latches reset at once. This is fine since you'll never need to undo a piece, at least in theory. Now it comes a little bit more cluttered. The orange lines route the inputs from the bus, which I will get to, to these orange lines, which read it to each pixel. On every single orange line between the SR latches, there's a piston that determines whether an X or an O is gonna be placed. These brown lines connect all these pistons together and allow one input to control the entire board. This is fine because only one piece should be being placed at a time. You'll never need to be placing an X and an O. Now comes the bus on the various metal pieces. On the diamond, we can see the local board selector. This is comprised of four bits because unfortunately, 3 times 3 is 9, which doesn't nicely go into binary, meaning we have this extra fourth bit, which is only ever activated once. The same goes for the gold line, which is the pixel selector. These piston stacks you see here are just instant repeaters to help avoid delay within the actual display, but as you can see, there are places where repeaters are required. The blue denotes binary encoders and decoders. 
In the case of this one here, this is the local board selector decoder. Based on the input on these diamond lines, this input may turn off as it is here and lift up this white wool, which allows the latch line to activate this white wool line. I'm just going to give another brief illustration of what's happening here. Slick system uses a simple bus setup. The idea of a bus is that many devices connect to a handful of lines instead of having separate lines for each device, which would get out of hand quickly. If every device's input is connected together though, how can they distinguish which data is meant for them? Well, we could use control signals to tell each device when to input the data from the bus. The blue lines are decoding the piece select to tell which device to activate and read the data on the bus. The gold line acts in a similar way. However, instead of only searching for one single input on the bus, it has to interpret every input. As you can see here though, there are more than just nine inputs. This is because I used the gold bus to not only select what pixel, but also to indicate whether I wanna place a large X or O, or if I wanna clear the board. Now, luckily this fits perfectly within the footprints of the local board so they can be stacked together. These comparators here are being locked by these redstone torches, which are turned off when the latch line is activated Again, which can only be activated if the local board selector is in the correct state. Obviously, each local board will have a different setup for this binary decoder, so each board has its own input that it's searching for before it allows a latch to go through. Other than that, this is the majority of the board. Nine of these local boards are stacked together to make the large game board. As you can see, all of these buses are connected in series. There's three layers, and within each layer, it's run in a row again with instant repeaters to help reduce delay. Let's do a quick demo of the display. I'm gonna write an X to this piece. Down here I need to toggle in the board ID, which is one, zero, zero, zero. The X or O bit, which I'll set to one for X, and the piece ID, which is one, zero, zero, zero. Now I just need to toggle in the data, and you can see here that the display captured it. All right, I hope you guys can see the inner workings of each display. I'm still deciding how I want to progress with my own display design, and we'll show you that in the next video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss what is hopefully my second to last display video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below. Until next time.